the term hypocrite is a term for play acting or pretending to be something that you're not. At some level, the term hypocrite is just an uh, accusation of disingenuousness or inauthentic faith or fakeness as we might talk about it. When I read Matthew chapter 6, I think um, kind of in terms of Jeff Foxworthy, and I hate to bring that up here in church, but um, I was uh, impacted by his comedy when he talked about uh, some people don't know that they're rednecks, and so they, they need some tests to determine if they are rednecks, and he would say things like, uh, you might be a redneck if, uh, if the front porch falls down and kills five dogs. Right? You might be a redneck if uh, going to the restroom at night involves slippers and a flashlight. Right? If uh, you mow your yard and, and find a trailer, you might be a redneck. And so I think of Matthew chapter 6 in those terms to some degree um, because the term hypocrite has been leveled against the church in general and even in churches specific and of Christians saying, I don't want to go to church because it's full of hypocrites. To which I usually respond, exactly. That's why we need to be in church. There's a, a big gap between my real self and my ideal self. And that comes across as hypocrisy a lot, I presume. But there are some attitudes that Jesus points to in chapter 6 that suggests you might be a hypocrite if. If you give gifts in order that people notice you as a generous person, you might be a hypocrite. If you give gifts to get gifts in return, you might be a hypocrite. If you take the opportunity to answer the question in Sunday school, Jesus, so people see how bright you are, you might be a hypocrite. If, uh, if you love to pray those flowery prayers that sound like poetry to the ears of those who notice you, you might be a hypocrite. If when you practice your piety, you're fasting, and people around you know you're fasting, and you win their respect with it, and you like their respect, you might be a hypocrite. If you do good things for your own honor, that people notice you, that you have a reputation in the community, that you hold a position in the church. If you do these things so that people say, oh, that's the real deal, you actually might not be. You might be a hypocrite. When I think about the ways that I like to feed my ego, I don't know if you're like me. But if I give a gift so that I am noted as a, a generous person, if I get a gift, not even to get a gift in return, but just to get the credit for giving the gift, then my gift might be disingenuous. Another Jeff Foxworthy thing that we remember, we listened. This, when we got married, um, that was before... Uh, a lot of the cell phone stuff and all that jazz. And we still had like 
the tapes you could rewind with a pencil that you put in the deck of the car. And we stopped at a truck stop on our honeymoon and picked up a Jeff Foxworthy uh, tape. And uh, there was something that was spoken on our honeymoon to us through Jeff Foxworthy that seems to be true <laughs> throughout life. I hate to admit it because you will think less of me. But I found that Jeff Fox is right. He said, you know, the way that men and women uh, need recognition are a little bit different. A woman will do all the housework. She'll be out resurfacing the driveway. And the husband will be like, don't worry about the ashtray. I emptied that. And I find again and again when I take out the trash, when I do the dishes, I just like for my wife to notice. She spends the whole day taking care of tasks that just need to get done. And um, you know what? I don't always notice. I rarely comment. I think I, I might be entitled. She's at home after all, and who else better to get everything done? And then I wonder why she's exhausted on the weekends. But when I take out the trash... Hey, did you notice that I did that for you? Stay in the kitchen a little longer. Did you hand me one of those bags so that I can reline the trash can? Yeah. So if you do all your good deeds, if you practice your righteousness before people for their praise, for your honor, for your glory, so that you are noteworthy and respected in the community, Jesus says you might just be a hypocrite. So let's read what Jesus actually says. Because that was the Jeff Foxworthy version. Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, Be careful that you do not Display your righteous acts before people in order be, to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you will not have your reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound the trumpet as the hypocrites do in synagogues and in the streets, that they might be honored by people. Tell you the truth. They have their full reward. But when you give to the poor, do not allow your left hand to know what your right hand is doing so that your charitable acts will be done in secret and your father who sees what is in secret will reward you. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray aloud in the synagogues and on street corners that they might be noticed by people. I tell you the truth. They have their reward in full. But when you pray, go into the inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who is in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up meaningless phrases like the Gentiles do. For they suppose they will be heard because of their many words. So don't be like that. For your Father knows what you need even before you ask Him. So when you pray, pray this way. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, 
then your father will not forgive your transgressions. Whenever you fast, don't put on the gloomy face and neglect your appearance so that people will notice that you're fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that your fasting may not be noticed by people, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what in, is secret will reward you. We learned in chapter 5, it, it doesn't take the practice of wicked behavior. It doesn't, it doesn't take um, murdering or committing adultery or bearing false witness to be a sinner. If you're angry with your brother, you've already sinned in your heart. If you lust with your heart, you've already sinned in your heart. So throughout chapter 5, we've seen all of these different things, these, these things that in the Old Testament we learned, thou shalt not do. And Jesus says, even if you don't do the bad behavior long before you've done the bad behavior, the sin, your heart is already sinful. And now what we learn is that our heart can be sinful even when we do good things, when we do righteous things, when we have good churchy behavior. Right? When we live out Christian lives, we can do it for all the wrong reasons and our heart can remain sinful. So there's a lot more to deal with, but today I just want to deal with that one major issue about getting God the glory and not getting our glory because this is something that's repeated in three different examples by Jesus. The first is in our generosity? How can our general generosity be genuine? How can we really give and mean it for the glory of God? See, often when we give, we think of what we receive. We, um, we do it for the motivation of our, our own honor. Sometimes we give just because it feels right. We want to do what's right, and it makes us feel good about being right, respectable. Sometimes we're judgmental. Tithers can be that way, right? I tithe, mint, and dill, and look at the others. They don't do their part. I carry this church. Ah, you've received your reward in full. Why give? Why serve? Why do we do these things? Soli Deo Gloria. For the glory of God alone. I studied psychology at OSU as an undergrad, and I was very interested in social psychology. One of the areas of my study was helping behavior, what makes people help. And what I learned through that study is that lots of things have to be in place for a person to actually help. And usually, when we help, it's not from altruistic motives, but because we get something in return. And that was a lot of fun. We got to test people when they didn't know they were being tested. Lots of our psych Tests were done on the public in public places at OSU, um, food courts and places like that. Had lots of fun. But sort of at the end of it, I thought, like, surely the, the, the church is different than the campus. Then I read a study where they did it at a seminary. They had someone in need, an actor, on the way to a very important chapel Everybody passed this person by, and the lesson in the chapel 
was the Good Samaritan. Uh -huh. So Christians have a hard time with the stuff too. God gets the glory when we are generous. When we practice acts of generosity and, and give to the poor and are charitable and we and tithe to the church and we, we don't have strings attached, we don't designate our money, we just simply put it before the Lord. If I were to take everything in these two bins here, and, and put them on an altar and set them on fire, it should not be offensive to you. It should be a fragrance aroma before the Lord if we burn the money before him. Because the heart surrenders the gift for the glory of God. He's worth it. So that's the first thing is we just want to, we, we need to understand that, that God is worth the glory, and that's what we, in the end, do all things for. Whether we eat, whether we drink, whether we give, whatever we do, do it for the glory of God. The second thing um, that's hypocritical is this, this piece of prayer, and that's something that I want to focus on a little bit because prayer actually uh, tells you more about your theology than anything else you do. It's the most intimate part of our Christian faith. It's when we actually talk to God. And so how we talk to God tells us what we believe about God. If we bargain with God, we know that we're trying to win his favor over, that we're trying to make a deal, that he somehow could use something that we have that he doesn't have, or that if we do such and such, then God will be obligated to recognize our good works and then work in our favor. If in our prayer we believe that God has to be convinced to do something good for us, then we don't really believe theologically that he is for us. He has to be wooed. So how remarkable that we would use that most intimate part of our faith as a display for our own glory. You know the kind of prayer. Maybe you've prayed it. Eloquent, thought out, great words that will move people. Lots of adjectives and run-on sentences. Do you know the type of prayer I'm talking about? The one that they could make a song about, right? In fact, the one that contains lyrics from the old hymns that everybody loves. Those are the prayers that impress people. Can you imagine? This is hard for a pastor to talk about. <laughs> I pray those kinds of prayers sometimes. Right here, front and center. Oh, if the attention is supposed to come this way, let me repent and turn it that way. May not my prayers reflect on me. By grace alone, through faith alone, an empty vessel crying out to a heavenly father who loves him. It's tricky. You know, doing bad things for the wrong reasons, it all lines up, it's easy to figure out. But doing good things, good prayers, good giving, it's harder to recognize the ul ulterior motives of the heart. You have to really examine yourself. Am I doing that for me or am I doing it for God? Am I doing that to be respectable, to be loved, to be admired? Or am I doing that to turn the attention heavenward? See how tricky that is? 
because it can be the, the same action, but for the wrong motives turns it into sin. And the praise that you get from people is the full reward. So there's a lot of pastors who don't like it when you compliment their sermons. No, no, I just want to get my reward in heaven. Don't give it to me now. I'm not one of those pastors. You can compliment me all you want. But I take that humbly because I know it's not a reflection on me. It's not by some great effort that I'm able to stand before you. It's not on some great skill. You know, I was a learning disabled child. Couldn't remember anything. So um, that's God. And I just want to make sure God gets the glory for that because, you know, I'm a very much pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of guy. I really want to earn my respect. I really want to, to tell my elementary school teachers who didn't believe on me, look where I stand now. But if I do that, I'm taking credit for what God did. I don't want that. Because I know there's actually nothing that great about me compared to you and the kids I grew up with. I'm a recipient of grace beyond grace, and I'm thankful for that. And as long as it lasts, let me bask in the glory of the Lord. As long as he gets the glory. The third one is fasting. And I think that just stands for all kinds of piety. Because we do meditation. We do prayer. We do intercessory prayer groups. We uh, fast together. Sometimes we um, meditate. Sometimes we do other spiritual dis disciplines. Um, and when we do those spiritual disciplines, there's this really strange dynamic in Christian churches in how public or private should I make it? Because all of us kind of remember Matthew chapter 6 echoing, like, you're not supposed to make a big deal if you're going to fast. And so I want to talk about that a little bit because I think there's two ways that you can behave in a sphere that's not entirely private and you can still be okay. And that's important for someone like me because a lot of what I do in my faith is not just private. So, and I'm not just trying to justify myself here, but I really think this is, this is genuine. I think this is real. So there's the kind of fasting that you do where... Um, I remember when I was studying in seminary, this happened to me once. I was studying so much, I felt so desperate. I was having such a hard time. Um, I had been reading with my, my head down and my hand on my head and my hair was sticking up cockeyed. I had big circles under my eyes. I was hanging on by a thread and exam week was coming. And I got a bill that I couldn't pay and I remember going to Pastor Wayne and kind of in my sort of disheveled, place. I was actually on staff at the time. I, I, it was unbecoming. I went to him and I thought maybe if he sees how beat up I am, he'll be generous with the benevolence fund and help me pay this bill so I can get back to work. I did not comb my hair before I talked to him. I was like, ah, just let it be. If he sees me, this is the real me. No, that was the desperate me on display. And one of my friends came to church and saw the conversation and said, oh my gosh, you look awful. What's going on? And, and, and this verse came to mind. Holy Spirit does that to me sometimes. I wanted people to know how hard I was working. I wanted them to see, you know, isn't that weird? You neglect your appearance. You look gloomy. So people think, wow, that person's really going after it. So that's wrong. That's a wrong example. But here's what I think is right. Around the same year, we decided as college students that during uh, Ramadan, which is a Muslim time of fasting, 
that we would honor God by fasting. We would we would uh, fast for three days. And then there was this debate. Now that we've talked about it, we've made it public, what are, are we doing it for the wrong reasons? And I determined, no, this isn't wrong. Because by letting people know that I was fasting and giving honor to our God, I was encouraging others to also give him glory. So there's a difference between the way that I approached Pastor Wayne, where I was trying to get approval for how hard I was working and how, what kinds of sacrifice I was making. That was wrong. But when I was encouraging my brothers and sisters to fast with me and to let them know, iron sharpens iron. And our prayers during the fast time were building us up in Christ for God's glory. So there was a distinction between those things. I'm not saying that this is an excuse to make your faith private. Because you know what happens when all of our faith is private? We just slip away from doing it all together. There's no accountability. If someone talks to you about your prayer life, you're very uncomfortable and you're just say, that's private. That's just between me and the Lord. But the truth of the matter is this. There's nothing there. So there can be this false piety where our privacy just keeps us away from brotherly and sister, sisterly accountability, which we need to thrive as a church. So, I hope I've muddied the waters for you. Because they're muddied here most of the time. That's why we go and examine our heart again and again before the Lord. And we ask the Spirit to examine us and see if there's any wicked way in us. If there's any false motivation. If there's any fake in our faith, anything phony about us, anything that's for the, our own glory, anything for the applause of people. And we ask the Spirit to remove that sin far from us, that God may get all, all the glory, all the honor, all the power, all the praise. It's His due. So how do we even respond in the soup of maybe we're hypocrites? Maybe there's falseness. How do we like move on in genuine faith? And I think it goes back to the solas. So pardon my Latin. Our faith is in Christ alone. We do nothing to earn our place. Our faith is in Christ alone. His blood alone saves us from our sins. His sacrifice alone picks us up out of our brokenness. His power alone leads us further. It's in Christ alone that we have this great faith. It's in Christ alone, no other means, nothing else is good enough, not by the coattails of your parents or your church will you find righteousness. There is nothing else. This is how sure I am that there is nothing else but Christ that can make you right before God. Because Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane on the eve of his crucifixion bent his knee and bowed his head to God in heaven and said, Father, if there be any other way, remove this cup from me. And guess what? God sent him to the cross. So don't cheapen it telling people, it, there may be Jesus, there may be, there's no other way. Christ alone that's our faith. Christ alone, in his desperation, he pleaded with God for another way. There is no other way, and that's why he went to the cross with you in mind. He counted you worthy. You don't have to prove yourself. 
You don't need honor. You don't need praise. Give it to Jesus. He's the one who did it for you. See, that's what Paul tells the Ephesians. You are saved by grace so that no one can boast. It is not by works so you don't get the credit. Grace alone. Through faith alone. Faith is just a posture of complete dependency and emptiness. And how do we know this is true? Scripture alone. The the scripture tells us. There's no question. Again and again. To the glory of God. To the glory of God. To the glory of God. God gets the glory. Jesus did it all. He paid it all. Here's the cool thing. God counted you worth the sacrifice. That's great love. And in the end, our redemption is for his glory. So there's one last thing I want to talk about. Because you notice this language of reward. Just so that you you pay attention to it. He says, they have their reward in full. Right? The hypocrites. But you will be rewarded by your heavenly father if you give with genuine motives, not seeking praise. You will be rewarded by your father who sees what is secret when you pray in secret. When you don't put on the gloomy face and you anoint your head and you wash your face and bright-eyed and bushy-tailed you fast so that nobody knows but your Father in heaven, when he sees what is done in secret, your Father who sees what is in secret rewards you. And so there is, I don't want to get away from this, there is this sense of reward, reward, reward. Here's the most amazing thing about the gospel, that he who loses his life will find it. He who sacrifices his ego will be lifted up. He who humbles himself will be exalted. The first will be the last, and the last will be the first. Don't try to get first. Be last. God makes you first. Do you hear again and again the direction of the message of the Bible? When God gets the most glory, we get the most reward in it. John Piper says it in perhaps the best way I've ever heard it. He says, we are most satisfied in God when God gets the most glory in us. There is reward. Are we together? God gets the most glory when his people, his church, are most fulfilled, most filled up, most satisfied in him. Jesus is enough. You don't need the applause of people. And when you turn the glory back to God, this is the beautiful thing about it, and this is not why we do it, but it's a little hedonistic if you ask me. We bask and bask and bask in that glory and we reap the benefits of a right relationship with our Heavenly Father. When we glorify Him, He fills us up. He gives us a purpose. He gives us a reason. He makes us feel special. He counts us worthy. He builds up our self-esteem. He loves us. He respects us in Christ alone. So when we, we give it all up, When we lose our life, for Christ's sake, lose your life. We find it all. It's like what Jesus said about the kingdom of heaven. It's like a treasure in a field. Man finds the treasure. He goes and sells everything he has. Everything. He buys the field that he might have that treasure. As we close today, would you pray with me that we would see God's glory as the treasure worth losing it all for? I can't make myself want that. There's no way I can make you want that. I approach this sermon with fear and trepidation because I'm afraid that it'll sound like nonsense. 
But this is the gospel message. He who loses his life for my sake and for the gospel will find it. He who humbles himself will be exalted. He who seeks no honor, no accolades, no exaltation, no esteem, no respect, no recognition, no position. He who's willing to surrender it all and lay it down on the altar before the Lord. He who says, here I am, do what you want with me, whether it's sweeping the floors or preaching the sermon. Here I am, do what you want with me, whether it's changing diapers or walking people across the street. Here I am. Take me and do with me whatever you want for the glory of your most holy name. There's no way that I can adequately communicate that. So, I want to end by simply praying that the Spirit would do that work in the attitude of our heart. Turn us to be God-glorifying instead of self-glorifying.